Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. We're going to start a playlist here where we're going to talk about the physiology of osseous tissue. Now, osseous is a fancy term for bone. In fact, generally when you see something that has the prefix OS, it's referring to bone. Osseous is a term that means bone, so that's what we're going to be looking at, the skeletal system. And in fact, it's a very useful thing to know that osseous means bone because anytime we have something in physiology that starts with OS, it's generally going to be referring to something about bone. For example, if we talk about ossification or ossifying, that's a process by which we convert something into bone. Normally that something is cartilage, and we'll actually see that in later videos. We'll briefly mention it today as it relates to the parts of a long bone. Or we can have cells called osteoblasts, osteoclasts. We'll talk about those in a couple videos from this. So osseous just means bone, and collectively all the bones make up what we call the skeletal system. In this video, we're going to be discussing the parts of a long bone. But what is a long bone? A long bone is really just a bone that's much longer than it is wide. And this is a really good example of one right here. This is actually the human femur. Okay? The femur is the proximal bone in your leg. Uh, the humerus is another great example. The radius, the ulna, tibia, fibula, those are all great examples of long bones. They're much longer than they are wide. And all long bones have certain characteristics. Um, some of the more basic ones are, are listed over here, and we're actually going to group them in certain ways. So the first way we can divide up these terms for the parts of the long bone are regions. And regions are really just fractions of the length of the long bone itself. So for example, we can be talking about the ends of the long bones, we can be talking about the middle region, which is the shaft, and there's even a smaller region in between those. Those are regions. And in general, there's two major ones. We have epiphyses and the diaphysis. Epiphyses is plural. There's actually two epiphyses. We have what's called a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis. So epiphysis is singular. But in general, the epiphysis is the end of a long bone, and there's two ends. This one up here, the proximal epiphysis, is the one that actually is closer to the torso whereas the distal epiphysis is further from the torso. So this is the femur bone. So actually up here is where it actually inserts into the pelvis. So this would be the proximal epiphysis because it's the proximal end. Down here would be the distal epiphysis because this is actually what uh, articulates with the knee joint, that is the tibia. So this would be the distal end, therefore distal epiphysis. Okay. The middle part of the long bone, which is the shaft, is called the diaphysis. And the diaphysis of note is hollow. Now, it's not just completely empty, okay, it is a space, but it actually contains something important called yellow bone marrow. Okay, we'll actually look at that more in a couple minutes, but understand the diaphysis is the shaft of the long bone and it is hollow. There's also another region that sometimes we don't talk about called the metaphysis. The metaphysis lies in between each epiphysis and the diaphysis. And what's important about the metaphysis is that it contains something called the epiphyseal line. Now the epiphyseal line is actually just a bony region that ultimately came from what we commonly call growth plates, or in physiology terms, the epiphyseal plate. So the epiphyseal plate in younger children who have not yet reached their maximum height, in other words, they have not finished puberty, this epiphyseal plate is a region of cartilage. And what it does is it allows the bone to grow in length. Um, note that there's also one in the metaphysis down here. But it would be called epiphyseal plate when it's made of cartilage. And it allows the bone to grow in length because obviously, but from the time we're two years old to the time we're 20, we're taller and longer, right? Now at some point, when puberty is complete, this epiphyseal plate becomes ossified, meaning it is converted from cartilage into bone, and when that occurs, it's now called an epiphyseal line. So the epiphyseal plate is in children who have not yet completed their growth. Epiphyseal line is the adult mature form, but this is contained in a region called the metaphysis, okay? which each metaphysis separates the corresponding epiphysis from the diaphysis. So those terms collectively are regions of the long bone. 
Okay, now we have what are called layers. So think of layers like you're going out in cold weather, right? You might have an undershirt, and then you have a regular shirt on over that, and then you have a sweatshirt on over that. Okay, that's what we're talking about, layers. I've got a schematic down here. I'm showing a region of the diaphysis here. And what we see is the outer layer is what we call the periosteum. This is the most superficial layer of the long bone. And what we see here in this diagram is we can see it being peeled off. Okay, so that's the outer layer, the periosteum. Okay. There's an inner layer called the endosteum. Here they kind of show it as the inside lining of the medullary cavity, which is actually the inside of the diaphysis. We'll mention that in a few minutes. Um, but the endosteum is the inner layer. Now, remember how I said in the diaphysis region of the long bone, it's hollow. Okay? This hollow region okay, actually has a name, and like I said a minute ago, it's the medullary cavity. So the medullary cavity is the hollow space inside the diaphysis, and the lining of that medullary cavity is the endosteum. Okay? Now, again, superficial, that is the periosteum. And if we look in the region of the diaphysis, between the periosteum and the endosteum, this region right here is made of a type of bone tissue called compact bone. We'll get into that in a minute. But compact bone is a type of bone tissue that's very, very strong. Okay? And it actually exists between the periosteum and the endosteum, among some other places. Okay? Now, also of note is that inside the medullary cavity, there's an important substance called bone marrow. Most bones in the uh, in children and infants contain red bone marrow, and eventually most of those long bones, actually that red bone marrow converts to what we call yellow bone marrow. But the key is that inside the diaphysis, inside the medullary cavity of adult long bones, we actually have yellow bone marrow. And of course, up here it's actually been removed, but it goes the entire length of the medullary cavity of the diaphysis. Okay. So again, the medullary cavity, which is the hollow part of the diaphysis, is not empty. It contains things like yellow bone marrow. All right. Now we have types of bone tissue. There's two major types of bone tissue, and that's just what is the composition of the bone? What does it look like at the microscopic level? And those two types are compact bone and spongy bone. At the end of this video, we're going to briefly look at some microscope images of these, so you'll be able to see the differences up close. Compact bone is much stronger. It's much denser. And we actually find compact bone really along the superficial region of the diaphysis. Remember I talked about this being compact bone right here. And then also along the superficial regions of the epiphyses. So pretty much on the outside of the bone. And it would make sense to have that type of tissue on the outside of the bone that is superficial because if it's stronger it's going to be able to resist breaking better than the weaker type which is called spongy bone. And actually there's a couple other terms I want to mention for spongy bone that you might see. One is called cancellous and the other is called trabecular bone. Okay? Um, all three of these terms mean the same thing, spongy, cancellous, and trabecular. And I like the term spongy bone actually a little bit better because it really describes better the appearance of that bone. Now, first of all, where do we find it? We find it really in the metaphysis and the epiphyses. Again, you can't see them down here, but they would exist down at the distal end as well. And it's spongy because it literally looks porous has a lot of holes in it, almost like a giant labyrinth, okay? and it has a lot of space. And really the function of it is to reduce the weight of the bone so that we're not carrying around tons of weight, literally. Okay? So this spongy bone is important for reducing the weight. Okay? But it can also act as a shock absorber as well. Okay? So the spongy bone is going to exist deeper inside the bone, but really only in the ends, that is the epiphyses and the metaphyses on each end. Right? Now one other thing before we go look at the microscope images is if we look at the ends of the long bones, particularly in the regions where they articulate with other bones, meaning they form a joint, we have this layer of cartilage called articular cartilage. Now this cartilage is protective. Imagine for one moment that you don't have this cartilage here. So this is actually the head of the femur. It will, it will actually articulate with the pelvis and form the hip joint. Imagine for a moment that this is not here. In that case, you would have bone rubbing against bone. That is, the head of the femur is going to be rubbing against 
what we actually call the acetabolum of the hip joint, so bone on bone. That is bad. That is actually excruciatingly painful, and there actually is a medical condition where this articular cartilage is degenerated, and you have bone rubbing against bone. That's called osteoarthritis. Um, it's a chronic condition, in a lot of cases caused by overuse injuries, like just long-term, long-distance running is a really good example, that will eventually wear down this cartilage. Okay. So fortunately, assuming we're a healthy individual, we have this cartilage and we have it on both ends of the long bone. Okay. And again, it's to protect against this situation we could have of bone rubbing against bone. Okay. So it acts as a cushion, also, to some extent, acts as a shock absorber, but really it's protective. And if it was to wear down from overuse, we would have really bad problems. And if this, since this would be the hip joint, this might actually cause the need for a hip replacement, okay? Or a hip arthroplasty, as we might call it, okay? So now let's go on and let's take a look at some microscope images of cancellous bone, as a spongy bone, and compact bone. So in terms of the histology of compact bone, we've already seen that. That's actually what we looked at on this microscope image right here. So when we looked at the ostean, also called the haversion system, this is a microscope image of compact bone. That's what this is. So where you see a central canal and there's concentric lamellae that lie around that central canal in rings, all these osteans, this is compact bone. In fact, Compact bone is the only type of bone tissue that actually has osteans, okay? And of course, we have these other pieces like the canaliculi. We, of course, have the osteocytes that are situated in the lacuna. And then these regions, which we defined later on as interstitial lamellae uh, between the osteans, okay? And just to remind you, the regions that have the compact bone are the outer surfaces of really all of the long bones. So the epiphyses out here, the outer surface is compact bone, the metaphysis, and then really all of the lining of the diaphysis is compact bone. Now for spongy bone, which we also call cancellous or trabecular bone, that's in the metaphysis and the epiphyses up here. Okay, so up here and then down here we can't see them, but they're also in the metaphysis and the epiphysis down here. Spongy bone is going to look very different, okay? And I mentioned before that it was spongy or porous in appearance. And this is a scanning electron micrograph image of trabecular bone. Now you can see it looks very, very different. And you can definitely see the porous or sponge-like appearance of this bone. It's not solid. Now this space accomplishes two things. One, bone is heavy. Okay, it's a heavy type of tissue because of the matrix. All this space in here basically reduces the apparent weight of the bone. If all the bone was compact bone, we would be much, much heavier, and we would require a lot more muscle mass in order to move ourselves around. So this reduces the weight of the bone uh, significantly. But the other thing that it allows is the spaces between the bone of spongy bone contains bone marrow. Okay, And in youth and infancy, most of that bone marrow is red bone marrow. Now, when we get into adulthood, some of the red bone marrow is converted to something called yellow bone marrow, and we're not really going to talk about the differences between those in this video. But it suffices to say that between the bony regions right here in these spaces, this is where we have the bone marrow. So this is a scanning electron micrograph image. Very cool. A little bit disturbing if you've got that trypophobia thing, and if you don't know what trypophobia is, you can venture to look that up on Google Images. And I find it kind of unnerving. This kind of resembles that. So now let's go look at an actual light microscope image. So this is actually what we would normally consider histology. And we're going to see the various pieces here. So all these pink regions, these are actually the bony regions. Okay. So these pink regions are basically where we see the bone here in the scanning electron micrograph image. Okay, And these bony regions are called trabeculae, and that's actually where we get the name trabecular bone, which is an alternate name for spongy or cancellous bone. Okay, So these are trabeculae. Now if we look at the lining of the trabeculae, this layer of cells, and I'll kind of zoom in a little bit here, um, we can see that it actually stains a little bit purple. This layer that 
lines the trabecular bone is called the endosteum. Okay, remember that the endosteum I mentioned in the long bone slide, I mentioned was the inside lining of of the bone tissue. We do see endosteum in the region uh, with the compact bone here lining the medullary cavity, but the region lining the spongy bone, that is the trabeculae, okay, this is also endosteum. Okay. Additionally, we also have in the superficial region right here, we have a layer of periosteum. Okay. But we're going to focus more on the endosteum here because it directly lines the trabeculae. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, all the space between the trabeculae, this is all bone marrow, okay? And I'm going to make the assumption right now that this is red bone marrow because we actually see some white blood cells here. Remember that the bone marrow, its major function, at least the red bone marrow, is the production of white blood cells. In fact, blood cells in general, but we can actually see several different leukocytes or white blood cells here. If we zoom in, Okay, right here, this very large cell that kind of looks like it's staining a little bit pink, but then it has a purple center, this would actually be a megakaryocyte. And a megakaryocyte is basically the precursor cell to platelets. So the megakaryocytes are produced in the bone marrow, and then later on, as we'll see uh, in a very future video, these will fragment into platelets, but they're produced in the bone marrow. This is just one example of a cell that we can see. Um, right here we see, and really these are everywhere, these very dark purple staining cells. These are most likely granulocytes, and if you haven't talked about those yet, granulocytes are a class of white blood cell. They contain neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, but pretty much all these dark purple uh, dots right here, these are going to be your granulocytes. Okay. Now, um, one more thing I want to mention about uh, this type of tissue is that even though it's very different in appearance than compact bone, it still has osteocytes. And so if we look at the trabeculae, if we zoom in, we can see them a little bit. There's not super good resolution here, but each one of these purple dots here that's within the trabeculae, these purple dots are the nuclei of the osteocytes. So this tells us we have osteocytes here. And then this little white region that you see surrounding it, that's the lacuna. So I've went ahead and boxed it here, but they're everywhere. These are osteocytes situated in their spaces called lacunae. Okay. So again, this appearance-wise is very different than we see for compact bone. Compact bone is arranged in osteons. Spongy bone or trabecular bone does not have osteons. It has trabeculae, but the commonality between both types of tissue is that the, they both have osteocytes situated in lacunae, but no osteons in spongy bone. Instead, they have trabeculae, and these spaces between the trabeculae contain bone marrow. All right, so hopefully this gave you a good understanding of the differences between trabecular bones, also called spongy bone, and then also compact bone, and you understand the locations of each. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.